so to recap over the last couple of weeks, the first week then I was talking about just getting started with meditation, that the core method is to bring your attention back to the breathing. The breathing, in fact, is only one meditation object. There are many possible meditation objects. Some people like to use a mantra. A mantra is a repeated word or phrase that you run over and over again in the mind so that it will push out or drown out all the other thoughts, all the other ideas and you can attain to quite a feeling or state of serenity by doing a mantra. There are many different mantras that are possible. Very often the simpler the better. One of the famous ones in Thailand is Buddho Buddho and you say Bud on the in-breath and To on the out-breath. Another famous one in Thailand is Samma Arahang, Samma Arahang, and I actually use this one. Om Mani Padmi Hang. There are many of these different mantras that is possible to use. Do you know the Thai mantra? Mai Pen Rai, Mai Pen Rai, Mai Pen Rai. <laughs> And because you are concentrating your mind on a mantra, it will push out or drown out all of the other kinds of thoughts and thinking and you attain to something quite a state of serenity. In some instances the, <clears throat> the mantra itself has meaning and in some instances it's just a word, it's just the sound that you make. If it has meaning, then you can be concentrating on the meaning. For example, may all beings be happy, may all beings be well. This is a mantra that we can use in order to arouse that feeling of metta or loving kindness. Other than mantras, there are visualizations. If you're more of a visual person, you can imagine certain things visually. I tend not to recommend this because it's for those of you who are visual people you can get quite caught up in visions and sights and images in the mind and usually these are a distraction it's not very often that they're actually really real and really useful but because they kind of appear magically in the mind it can feel as if you're having some kind of supernatural insight. Actually, it's just vision, it's just a, an image that has arisen in the mind. So I don't recommend that you really follow the visual things that arise in the mind because they can be a real distraction and can appear very beautiful or very intricate and very interesting, but they are not usually anything that is really profound or useful. <coughs> there are some visualizations. Uh, I like to visualize light. In fact, I visualize a very tiny, very bright grain of rice uh, down in the center of my body. This is a practice that I really like to do. If your mind gets quite refined in the meditation, what you can discover is the breathing becomes too coarse of a meditation object. If you can switch to light, light is actually a much more refined meditation object. There are others, there are uh, different forms of body meditation. Some people they switch from certain points in the body, it's another meditation you visualize uh, like a light in the center of your hand. There's ones where you move your arms, Lampotian method. So there are many different kinds of meditation object. 
The object that we would normally recommend is to use the breathing. Breathing is something that's very close to you and so if you've developed your meditation with the breath then you can f find and feel your meditation object very easily and very clearly all of the time. The breathing is also a very good barometer for the way that you're feeling. And our path of meditation is a path of insight. And by insight what we mean is the meditation should be turning your vision back, turning your awareness back onto yourself so that you understand your processes of body and mind. And it's this process of knowing yourself that will start to change you. So if you set forth a resolution of the kind of person that you want to be, I'm going to be perfectly calm and beautiful and peaceful and holy and that's just something you've generated with your ego, with your willpower and it's very difficult to try and maintain that over a long period of time because ten minutes later you're getting in a taxi and he takes you to a different place than you wanted to go or somebody annoys you or you bang your foot and just that intention has gone out of your mind. So to produce a long-term effect, a long-term change, what we do is we practice this witnessing of yourself, witnessing of your processes, your body, your mind, how it works. And it's this knowing yourself that will change you. So in Buddhism we don't have thou shalt, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not worship graven images, thou shalt not live in Thailand without a visa. Though these kinds of things we don't really have in Buddhism. There are precepts and things that you may voluntarily undertake as a training. But the idea is that the onus is put back on you. You need to develop your own wisdom. And you do this by seeing yourself, and by seeing yourself that is real. That's not something religious, it's not something that we've put onto you. This is you seeing, well, your own processes. This is how it works. And by generating this kind of wisdom, what you find is that when you look at things internally, you start to behave differently to when you look at things externally. So you look at things externally and you want to change them, you want to change the world. You look at Donald Trump and you don't like Donald Trump, you think well how can I protest, how can I get him out of office, can we impeach him? Of course there's plenty of people that do like Donald Trump, probably not many here today but uh, there's plenty of people that do like him, so we have to remember our opinion is only that, it's only an opinion. But when you turn the vision back inwards, what you see is not the external characteristics, but what you see is, well there's this anger arising in me, and there's this hatred arising in me, or this greed arising in me, or this obsession arising in me. And when you see these things as internal qualities, what happens is you start to get wisdom, well, some things are worth developing, some things are not worth developing. So you see the greed, you see anger, you see hatred, you see jealousy, you see attachment, all of the negative qualities. When you feel them on the inside, you think, well, you know, I don't really want to have that quality in myself right now. So you're feeling angry. Externally you may have every justification for that feeling. But internally, when you turn the vision back, you say, well this is anger, it's not nice, it's not pleasant. Somebody may tell you, don't be angry, it's bad. It doesn't have much effect. 
But when you see it inside your own self, because you've trained your attention to turn back, then you start to want to give it up quite naturally. The Buddha's analogy for this was, imagine a young man or a young woman who is very fond of their appearance. And imagine you were to take a dead and rotting corpse of a dog and drape it over that person's shoulders. What would that young man or young woman, fond of their appearance, wish to do? The answer is, they would wish to remove that rotting dead dog corpse from their shoulders as quickly as possible. I love the language of the suttas, they really stark, clear metaphors. So in exactly the same way is when you start to see negative qualities inside yourself, because you're watching them and feeling them directly, you have this urge to cast them off. There's no longer any question of how do I deal with anger or how do I remove negative qualities or I'm just so greedy, how can I remove that? You know, that man, he went to the doctor and he had a problem with greed. He said, doctor, I'm just so greedy. And the doctor said, don't worry, we have pills for that now. And the man said, give me lots of them. <laughs> so when you see it directly, you naturally want to give it up. Greed is interesting because other negative qualities are quite quick to see them as negative. If you're really hateful or angry, it's quite easy to see that as a negative quality. But when you're greedy, that's much harder because you think, well, that thing's really nice. It feels like a nice state of mind. But to a meditator, what you see is this greed or this desire is starting to obsess the mind, starting to pull the mind into it. And it's this losing your wakefulness, losing your awareness as the mind condenses around that thing that you want. This is what you start to see as unpleasant and unwholesome. Okay, so, 20 minutes here counts to your 20 minutes a day. <laughs> Do try this, make this period a period where you're making that extra effort. I have a friend of mine and he insists that he cannot do meditation. And some years ago, he said he really tried. He said for a couple of months, he was in a Christian ashram. There are such things. It's a kind of hybrid. And he, he really tried at that time. And he said, you know, I felt really good when I did it. And I said, so why don't you do it now? He said, oh, I can't meditate. I'm like, but you did it. He said, no, I wasn't any good at it. I said, but you felt really good with yourself when you were doing it. So this is the thing. If you take that 20 minutes of time every day to stop and be with yourself, you'll start to really appreciate it. It will start to be a beautiful part of your day. If you do 10 minutes once a week, that 10 minutes is always going to be difficult, right? That 10 minutes is always going to be spent just trying to get any kind of awareness that you can. Your mind is a machine. It will just do exactly the way that you've trained it. It will work in exactly the way you've trained it to work. So from an early age, you've always been looking for things outside of yourself, stimulation, things to look at, things to see, things to do, things to learn. And your parents, you know, they congratulate you on the new things that you can do. And that's what parents are interested in. Right? 
I'm thinking of these guys with the baby over here. <laughs> That's what they'd like to do. You know what my mother used to do? She was, when I was very young, under six years old, because we moved house when I was six years old. And she trained me to remember my phone number. 353-5536. I was less than six years old when I memorized that number. It's still with me now. And if I couldn't say the phone number, my mother would be very unhappy with me. And then, when I could say the phone number, I didn't even get a treat, I just didn't, I didn't get like the unhappiness. So. My mother was trying to teach me the colors. Do you know Smarties? They're like uh, M&Ms, different multicolored M&Ms. And she'd line them all up in a row between her and I. And then she'd point to one of them and say, what color is that? And if I get the color right, I can eat it. <laughs> and if I get the color wrong, she eats it. <laughs> this was horrible. Tears would stream down my face. What color is that? They'd be like, is it blue? It's red. <laughs> What color is that one? I'll go, yellow. she would say, are you sure? i say, it's blue. she said, it's yellow. <laughs> she drilled this stuff into my mind. This is the way we are trained from a very early age to be always looking outside of ourself, you know, looking at the new thing that we can see, we can learn, we can do, we can taste. And to train the attention to come back, therefore, is difficult. It's actually the most natural thing in the world, just to be aware of yourself, just to be happy, present, breathing. And for those of you who do meditation, you know that sometimes the mind just comes together, and it's just there. When the mind has come together, there really isn't any need for a meditation method. You just know that you are here, you are awake, you are present, you are bright, very, very happy. But you are not in that state because the mind is a machine. You have trained it to always be working, always be jumping around. And then you sit for five minutes or you come to the temple or you come see me and the meditation doesn't work. You're like, well, I can't do meditation. Of course you can't. You haven't trained yourself to do it. It's only when you do the training, day in, day out, that then you start to get these experiences when the mind really does come together. These experiences are really uh, bright and clear. They're really... Uh, it's moving into a silence, <clears throat> all this chattering in the mind that you think is you, you think, this is me chattering in my mind, this is me doing things. But the interesting thing is, you are still there, even when the mind has completely stopped. So you start to get a sense of yourself, independent of the things that go on in the mind. This is important for enlightenment, which is unconditioned, but I'll go into the nature of enlightenment another time. So, moving into this silence, this is the mystic path, if you like. All religions, they have the exoteric path, the teachings that they have outside, that you should do this and you shouldn't do that, and the world is created in this way at that time, and blah, blah, blah. The stories. That's the exoteric. Buddhism has plenty of stories, too. You know, when the Buddha was born, his mother was standing up. <laughs> and then he's born and he lands on his feet and he takes seven steps. And a lotus flower appears under each footstep as he walks. Buddhism has its stories too. Actually, they're beautiful stories and stories are not supposed to be literally true. 
there comes a point where all of this exoteric teachings for all religions have these but they also have the esoteric teachings which is the I would call the mystic path like most men I like to think of myself as a bit of a mystery bit of an enigma <laughs> still waters run deep the mystic path is the side of religion the side of the that turns the attention around and goes inwards and every religion and even not even religions every culture has a teaching that has a group of people that have at some point wanted to kind of retreat a little bit from society turn the attention around and go into this mystery the mystery is what are you and the real way to find out what you are is to stop all the things that you think you are then you start to get this clear kind of understanding of the direction of what you actually are what you really are so this path in order to turn the attention around and see this silence be with this silence truly really the most beautiful thing sometimes if you are meditating well and you do your meditation before you go to sleep which is not allowed by the way that doesn't count to your 20 minutes you have to do the 20 minutes sitting at some point then when you go to bed you can do an extra 5 minutes 10 minutes but if you are doing your meditation as you go to sleep as your only meditation you start to draw that association in the mind that meditation is falling asleep sometimes you can feel just as you're waking up the meditation wakes up first you become bright and clear and mindful but you have no memory of who you are or what you're doing or and just for that time you're very very happy and then the mind starts to crank up oh i've got to go to work today i've got to feed the baby i've got to buy the something i have to pay my bills and this mind that cranks up and you see it you're like wow that's really kind of suffering if you can really meditate well as you're waking up you can even know which breath it was that you woke up on the in breath or the out breath do you believe me <laughs> i heard this said for many years and i was a little doubtful i thought this was one of those stories that meditation teachers tell and then one day i just i woke up and then I knew which breath I woke up on. I thought this is fantastic. And I called my friend and I said, oh, "You know that thing where you know which breath you woke up on?" I said, "I did it. I did it this morning. I knew." And he said, "Which one was it?" It's like I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> It's also said that you know which breath that you fell asleep on. I haven't done that one myself yet. I haven't I haven't got there yet. So how do we start to enter into this mystery According to the Buddha the first thing that we have to do is disentangle from the world This disentanglement is the job that we are doing with insight meditation And there are various ways that we do that but this week I want to concentrate on the primary way that we can use is a very clear mechanism is a very clear tool for this practicing this disentanglement uh this is called samatha vipassana the word samatha means tranquility it's closely connected to samadhi which means concentration The idea is when you concentrate on an object the mind will become calm will become kind of damped down and become very blissful in many cases and vipassana is mindfulness 
or insight, seeing and knowing what's actually happening. So these two practices go in tandem, they go hand in hand. And there is something of a kind of debate, some people say you must do concentration first until you get to perfect states of concentration, then you can do vipassana. And the other side is they say, no, 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 concentration, that's just making yourself calm. doesn't do anything for you. What you need to do is insight meditation. You need to be learning and developing qualities. When you go back to the original suttas, actually there was not really any difference between these two. The Buddha himself never made a clear distinction. He never said this is one kind of practice and then that's another kind of practice. Both of these were part and parcel of the path. So in this particular exercise for this week, Samatha Vipassana exercise, what we what I'm suggesting for you to do, or the tool that I'm offering up for you to pick up and use, is one of concentrating on your meditation object, just like we were last week, counting the breaths, focusing on the breathing. But now start to take more note of the things that pull you away from the concentration. Bringing those things, those distractions, into the attention, that's how you start to disentangle from the world. It's this entanglement that makes your meditation difficult. Because you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to sit, I'm going to watch my breath like a big gorilla, just sit and breathe. And unfortunately your mind has other ideas. Your mind decides, no, 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 now is the time to go worrying about something my mother said to me 35 years ago. Now is the time to start thinking about my retirement 35 years in the future. Now is the time to start planning out the design of the new building that I'm going to build, etc. The mind going like a machine, eh? So it's this entanglement that is pulling your mind out of the meditation. And every time something comes up into your mind, it comes up with an attachment. Now, by attachment, what I mean is like a little string. And the idea, the thought, the concept, the hope, the dream, the desire, whatever it is, when it arises, it's only just arisen. It's not something that has actually been there for 20 years. It's something that has just arisen into consciousness. And it arises with this attachment, and the attachment is like a little string that tugs you, that tugs on your attention. Come think about me, come be with me, come plan this thing out. Maybe a thought, past or the future, it may be a feeling in the body. You, know, you want to try and meditate, but your knee has other ideas. You know, no, come and think about me instead. Maybe a noise or a sound that's going on around you, something you like or something you dislike. It's just arisen. You know, outside my window in the temple, uh, uh, did you catch that one? <laughs> uh, 2,500 schoolgirls, and they make a lot of noise. Actually, the teachers make more noise than they do. They're the worst of, worst of it. And I don't like it, to be honest. And I have dreams sometimes of hanging enormous speakers outside my window and kind of... What I heard is if you re make a recording of the sound that's coming in and you play it back but slightly out of sync, it makes people thoroughly disorientated. So I've had dreams of plans of doing this. <laughs> but you know what happens? I can't stay annoyed at that sound for very long. Usually it lasts for an hour or so in the morning. That's okay. Uh, sometimes they have these concerts that go on all day and the, it'll rattle the coffee cup across your table, it's so loud. You know. I can't stay annoyed at it all day. The annoyance or the non-acceptance, it's just those moments where my mind condenses around that thing. I'll be sitting there doing my thing as 
quite happy and then suddenly I think, ah, that noise, or ah, I'm going to move. Ah, can I go and stay in Ariasom? And just at that moment where I pulled it into conscious awareness, that's that little string. That idea has just occurred, it's tugging on your attention. Come, think about me, be with me, feel me, feel me. It's important. <clears throat> and what happens is, if you don't follow that line of thinking, it fizzles, fizzles out. Even if it's something very big and important in your life, it will just fizzle out all by itself, unless you feed it with thoughts. They're like little trolls, you know a troll under the bridge? On internet forums they say don't feed the troll when someone's making deliberately inflammatory comments and you write back, that just feeds them and gets them more interested. People do this from time to time on my Facebook and they put in a real troll comment and I just don't respond, and then they go and troll somewhere else. If you don't feed it, it will fizzle out by itself. It's very interesting. So, you're sitting there, you're quite calm, you're quite happy, you're doing your meditation, and this thing pops up into your head. Come and think about me. Don't feed it with more thoughts. Then it will die out by itself. Why did these things come up? They come up because of karma, because you've thought about them, appreciated them, cherished them, you've had desire around them in the past. It's a habit. Karma is just a habit. So, you feel this tugging in the mind during the meditation, and you stop and say, I'm not going to follow after that line of thinking. Now, it may be there, you don't have to solve it. That's thinking about it, right? So, fighting against it isn't really going to work very well. You can do it in some cases, but for the moment I wouldn't recommend it. But feeling that uh, pull, that tug, that attention. Okay. So, where th these um, ideas are popping up, due to karma, because you've had them in the past, because of society, because of adverts, because of something somebody said to you that you didn't even notice. I had this boss one time, I was working as a wash-up in a restaurant when I was about 16, I think, and our head chef, his name was Adam, and he was quite a tough character, actually. And like all chefs everywhere in the world, this is an absolute truth, no matter what country you're in, or whatever restaurant you're in. Uh, chefs are bad-tempered, egotistical maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> Years after this, I actually worked as a chef, and I was exactly the same. It, it's, it's the nature of the job. And so when he would get in one of his funks when things weren't going right, I had this sure-fired way to calm him down. I knew that he had this uh, liking for the really stupid song, She Was Only Sixteen. Do you know that song? Shall I sing it? <laughs> it's like, no. She was only 16, she was only 16, she was too young to know. So what I would do is, if he was in a bad mood, I'd go walking by him and I'd go, She was only 16, only 16, and go off. Within 10 minutes, he'd be happy as a little lamb doing his chefing. He was only 16, only 16. He had no idea at all that idea came from me. But I planted that into his brain and flipped him like a remote control. I could flip his mood by doing this. I hope that one day he sees one of these videos and he says, who is you that's doing that? Where do all these ideas come from? I mean, that pop up into our brain. It's too much, it's too complicated to figure out. 
Do you know, you know of an English breakfast, right? Bacon, eggs, sausage. Or an American breakfast, bacon, eggs, sausage times two. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where that comes from? Edward Bernays. He was Freud's nephew. And he was employed as an advertising man by a bacon company to sell more bacon. So he invented the whole idea of this English breakfast where you have bacon for breakfast. Before him, nobody would have dreamed of having this heavy, salty, oily, fatty thing for breakfast. It doesn't make any sense. He put that idea in your head to sell bacon. And what he thought was, well, people eat this much bacon, I advertise they eat that much bacon, but if I make people who wouldn't normally eat bacon eat it, or at a time they wouldn't normally eat it, to eat it at that time, I will quadruple the sale of bacon, and it worked. And we still eat bacon and eggs for, you know, English or American breakfast. Same for Claude Hopkins. He didn't invent toothpaste, but he made everybody in the world use toothpaste. I'll tell you that story another time. The point is that these thoughts and ideas that pop up into your head, you're doing your meditation, and all these little ideas come, and when they come into your mind, they have a little tug, they're pulling on your attention. Where did the ideas come from? Where does all this stuff come from? We don't need to analyze. But don't follow after it. If you want to enter into the mystery, if you want to turn the attention around and bring it inwards, enter into the silence, enter into the really beautiful, majestic states of meditation, all of these will come through the silence. So in order to do that, we have to practice letting go of that one small thing at a time. That idea that has just popped up into your mind, that you need to let go of. Letting go is not about letting go of big things in your life. Letting go of your children, your health, letting go of your childhood, you know, try doing that. You have to pay a therapist a lot of money uh, in order to do that. Letting go doesn't come with big things. Letting go comes with little things, one breath at a time, one small thing at a time. So when the, you're sitting in meditation and then something is, comes up and starts pulling on your attention, you stop. Make a note of what that thing was. Then, drop it, come back to your meditation. And when I say drop it, don't worry if it stays there. What you're doing is dropping the following after it, dropping the attention that you're giving to it turn away in your mind. But your attention comes back to your meditation object. Every time you do that, you're practicing just that little bit, the letting go of the thing that has arisen. Then, later, you can let go of big things. I find in my life, I have plenty of things that kind of annoy me and get my attention, but if you give me half an hour just to stop, do my practice, I'd let go of everything. It's only when you've let go of everything that the mind really is able to turn around, come back inwards, enter into the silence, and then these majestic mind states start to manifest. So, we do this... Um, one small thing at a time. Think of it as like exercising a muscle. My friend over in the dance center, she's a ballet teacher, and she says, if you don't keep practicing your ballet, you don't strengthen those particular muscles around in your legs. And if you don't exercise them daily, you can never be a ballet dancer. So that's what we are doing with the meditation. Samatha vipassana. Samatha, concentration, means you're focusing on the breath as your core, as your place to come back to. Vipassana means you're paying attention to what distracts you. 
but you're willing to drop that thing and come back. So pure vipassana, we forget about the meditation object and we just focus on the thing that's arisen. But in samatha vipassana, mixing these two methods together, you are noting where your attention has gone to and then returning to your meditation object. So if you if the sound arises, sound of the baby, sound of the air conditioner, sound of someone going to the bathroom, attracts your attention, you stop. Hearing, hearing. Come back to your meditation object. If it's a thought that has arisen, you can just note thinking, thinking. If you want, you may distinguish between past or future, like planning or worrying. If you're thinking about the past, usually you're worrying. It's not many people think about the good things in the past. And if you're thinking about the future, usually it's planning, because usually you're thinking about the good things in the future that you want to get. But don't get too caught up in trying to find the right label for what your experience is. You don't think, well, is this thinking? Or is this... I'm thinking, but I'm thinking about some song that I heard. Is that in the past or the present? And is that hearing or is that thinking? Or is that internal? Or... Then you've lost the meditation. We're only using the label... Uh, in order to be able to let go of that thing. How is it letting go? Well, if something arises, something that you dislike, something that happened that you don't like, and it arises, and you stop and you note thinking, thinking. You've separated yourself from that topic. You've become a person who is witnessing that thinking rather than being caught up in the thinking. If it's desiring, you become a person who is witnessing the desiring rather than one who is caught up in the desiring. You know, I was walking past Klong Tom a while back. This is my favorite area, Thieves Market, right? It's where they sell the one thing in this world that I've never been able to let go of my desire for. Power tools. <laughs> And I was walking past the Makita shop and there was this twin 14 volts, twin battery, rapid charge, Makita cordless power drill with hammer action. And I just had to have it. I just, this little lawyer appeared on my shoulder and like, you, you really need this. I haven't drilled a hole in 10 years, but no, no, you need this. And then the little monk appears, like, you don't need it, you can let go of it. And uh, this guy says, no, 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 you can use it, you can drill holes for other people. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't selfish, this is for other people. You can go and help them with their things. This is an act of compassion if you buy this drill. <laughs> now I'm in it, I'm in the story, right? But if I stop and I label thinking, or wanting, I can, I've suddenly separated from it. I'm no longer wanting it. I'm witnessing a feeling of wanting arise. Separated from it, I'm one step back. Then I can react with more wisdom. Well, do I need it? Do I not need it? I didn't get it, by the way. I'm only telling you just in case you wonder what I want for Christmas. And <laughs> You know, I said this once to a friend of mine, he said, oh, is there anything I can get you? And I said, no, you have to be more specific than that. I said, do you mean like a cappuccino or do you mean like a 14-volt twin-pack Makita cordless power drill with hammer action? <laughs> he said, do you want milk and sugar in that? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so keep me awake so I can do meditation and get enlightened and save all world beings. That's what it was for. The coffee was for. <laughs> so, by labeling the thing that's arisen in your mind, you need to make this into a habit. Just like 353-5536, that phone number I learned when I was five years old, I can still remember 
because I made it a habit in the mind. So we develop this habit of labeling what's actually happening right now. This will then give you a step back from it, you're no longer involved in that state of mind. It may be that you need to follow it. You may have this thought arise, oh I'm going to go and write my book today. Well, maybe it's time for you to write your book. You can respond with wisdom. But what it's doing is it's giving you a choice. It's giving you a space between you and your mind, or between you and the things of the mind. So A, you can respond with wisdom to the things that arise in the mind. And B, you get used to disentangling yourself from all those things that tug on your attention in meditation, so that your attention can turn around, stop and start to see this silence and these beautiful inward states. What happens to that thought, idea, emotion when it has arisen, when you've labelled it, and when you've let go? You don't worry about it. We're not doing psychology here. We're not trying to fix your childhood or change your constructs. Meditation is like swimming. With swimming, all you have to do is throw the water behind you. So meditation is just the same. Whatever those thoughts and things are, throw it behind you. Don't worry, you'll still get on with doing the things that you need to do in the world. Is that clear enough? So, very simple meditation practice. You sit, watch your meditation object. When your attention is distracted, note that tugging on the mind. That's attachment. When we say that attachment causes suffering, that doesn't mean you're attached to your children, you're attached to your house, you're attached to your job, you're attached to your diet. All these things are important. Those don't cause suffering. They may cause suffering. But that's not what we're talking about. That's the exoteric teaching, that's what the external teachings. But the internal teaching is when you see these things inside. Attachment causes suffering. You can feel that the things that arise in your mind pulling you like a leash, have a leash around you and they're pulling you after them. Freedom is freedom from that attachment. Any question?